Wow, what a night. What a crazy night. Uh, night two of the Republican National Convention was kicked off, and there were uh, many different speakers, but out of all the speakers, I would say Melania um, stood out as um, one of the most non-political. Um, she took a very compassionate approach to um, addressing the pandemic, addressing the um, civil unrest in our country, and a few other things. My favorite speech and uh, was from actually President Trump's daughter, Tiffany, his youngest daughter, who was in school and just graduated law school. Um, I made a video about that earlier. Um, but before we get into this, I did want to briefly address that the reason why I haven't been doing live streams, um, first of all, I was very, I'm very new to the whole live stream thing, but it's because I ran, I, I don't have an internet provider because I live on a boat and um, I ran out of um, data on my devices. I'm trying to find a workaround for that, um, uh, like hotspot data. I'm trying to find a workaround for that right now and hopefully I can find that and then I can go back to live streaming. Of course, my data resets the beginning of every month around the 7th, so I'll be able to do more live streaming then. But anyway, let's look at this. Melania stands out uh, at convention by passionate, passionately addressing the pandemic. First Lady Melania Trump speaks at the second night of the 2020 Republican National Convention. It is a telling measure of our mean-spirited culture that the First Lady of the United States has been mocked and, vilip and vilified for daring to redesign the Rose Garden. Whether the design is um, pleasing or not, it was clear that the media would not be giving Melania Trump the Jill Biden treatment when she spoke to the Republican convention. She has been the least public first lady in decades, and English is not her native language. But the principal sin of this elegant former fashion model is that she's married to dot 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 him. In the run-up to Tuesday night's appearance, journalists kept bringing up her 2016 address in which a mishap caused her staff to plagiarize some passages from an old Michelle Obama speech. Yeah, that was an interesting mishap. Um, uh, I would say that uh, you look into that story for yourself, but basically uh, they ended up... Uh, she was doing research on how to do a good speech, and so she was watching speeches from different first ladies, and and somehow um, her staff, who was preparing the final edit of her speech, uh, forgot to take out um, a portion of Melania's speech or something like that. Uh, it is definitely um, um, of concern, but... Um, um, I think that that issue is long over, um, but I think that it is fair for the news to bring that up. And so I think that um, um, it's kind of, it's, it's okay that the news brought that up because it is part of the narrative, especially when she's giving her second, you know, speech before the RNC. Before a small audience in the revamped garden, Melania Trump did what virtually no other speaker had acknowledge the impact of the coronavirus and express sympathy for its victims. Wow, that's true. Oh, also, um, I noted that Melania's English was superb throughout her speech. I mean, she still had the accent. It was still hard to make out some of the words she said, but I thought her English had, was very improved compared to um, speeches I've heard her give recently. Uh, since March, she said, our lives have changed drastically. Because of the invisible enemy, she offered sympathy and prayers for those who have lost a loved one or are suffering, and said, Donald will not rest until an effective treatment is found. That was no small thing at a convention that talked about the pandemic in the past tense, when it was talked about at all. It wasn't just cheerleading, and she declined to use her time to attack the other side, which is true. Her Hers was the most, um, well, I mean, I thought the theme of the night was very unifying with some exceptions like the Pam Bondi speech and the Eric Trump speech, which I didn't care for, um, the Eric Trump speech, but I did think Pam Bondi uh, made a compelling case, whether you agree with it or not, it was a compelling case. While not a natural or 
order. The First Lady said she was humbled by coming here from a communist country and living the American dream. Despite negative and false media headlines, she said, the president won't lose focus on helping the country. She also talked about Africa, drug addiction, violence, and motherhood. It was, in short, a plain-spoken and compassionate talk. While some pundits on Twitter, Twitter credited Melania with speaking frankly about the virus, others question, questioned what she sees in her husband, ridiculed her outfit, or laughed at her delivery. One called it a Seinfeld speech about nothing. <sighs> it was left to the New York Times columnist David Brooks to scold, Stop scoffing Melania's speech is at least relatively decent and humane. Even fierce Republican Trump critic Mike Murphy called it the only high ground presidential speech you will ever hear at this convention. Her words even won over some of the TV pundits, from CNN's Dana Bash to MSNBC's Rachel Maddow, who said, that's the first time in two days we have had even a straightforward expression of sympathy. Fox's Dana Perino said she lights up the room, but Joy Reid complained about using the White House as a backdrop. They just, um, <laughs> Tuesday's proceedings, heavy on family members, including Trump and Tiffany, was low on celebrity wattage. The party trouted, uh, trotted out plenty of average citizens, from a Wisconsin dairy farmer to a Maine lobsterman, um, who, like Trump, it was a lower-key evening that sought to soften the GOP's image and strengthen its... Oh, my goodness. How do I make this? There it is. And soften. Um, what I thought was interesting about the, the Maine lobsterman is he said at some point in his speech that the um, ocean area that Trump opened up is not even an area that Maine lobstermen use. I'm from Maine, and um, I don't know a lot about the lobster industry because I'm not in it, but I thought that... Um, by Trump opening up that whole area, it was going to help the Maine lobstermen. Anyway, um, it was a low, lower-key evening that sought to soften the GOP's image and strengthen its connection to small business owners, with remarkably little mention of the coronavirus or the 30 million unemployed. In fact, Larry Kudlow essentially talked about the pandemic in the past tense. I did see that in a few speeches where they were saying um, in the past tense, but um, I think that I mean, it's obvious that they still acknowledge this in the present tense. Otherwise, there would be a traditional convention, which there's not. So they're acknowledging the, the, the virus just by the mere fact that there's no audience. The delegates are all separated. And when people do give speeches other than Melania's speech, they are, which Melania's speech was to, I think, just White House insiders. So um, they're all heavily tested people. Um, I'm not sure on that, but I think that was the case. Uh, so obviously, that's a false narrative. I just, I, I don't like the partisanship of that statement. The first night of the virtual GOP um, show drew about 16 million TV viewers compared to 19 million for the Democrats' first night. The number was about 30% lower than four years ago, similar to the Dem drop-off, and nearly half of the live audience, 7 million, watched on Fox News compared with MSNBC as the ratings leader for the Democrats, suggesting these convention programs have little cross-party appeal. Okay, what they don't mention there is the online traffic, which was through the roof. Um, the view counts on all the various live streams on YouTube uh, was through the roof, and I'm surprised they don't mention that in this article. Uh, Trump did pull off... Uh, two convention firsts by pardoning John Ponder, a reformed ex-convict who now helps other prisoners, and the other at a naturalization ceremony for legal immigrants. These were smart political moves, even if they were stunts, and underscore the power of incumbency to act rather than just talk. When former um, Florida Attorney General Palm Bandy, Pam Bondi went off on Hunter Biden and accused the family of uh, profiteering in China, it was a double-edged sword. The liberal ladies at MSNBC, aided by former FBI officials, rushed 
to remind viewers that Trump was impeached on grounds of pressuring Ukraine to cough up dirt on the Bidens, the battle royale that went unmentioned at the Democratic Convention. Wow. Similarly, MSNBC brought on another ex-prosecutor after Eric Trump's speech to explain that he has been asked to testify in a probe of the family's real estate firm by the New York Attorney General. A very, I mean, I can tell you right now, uh, uh, that is suspicious timing. Most likely a political prosecution to hurt Trump right now. Much like uh, um, it appears the Steve Bannon prosecution is, but um, uh, that has a little more legs to it, I think. CNN challenged some of his questionable statements, such as peace in the Middle East, a reference to a recent um, um, agreement between Israel and the UAE. The convention had its share of side controversies. One speaker was pulled at the last minute after the Daily Beast reported on a stunningly anti-Semitic tweet, and Mike Pompeo's short speech from Jerusalem is drawing sharp criticism in a House probe as he became the first Secretary of State to address a presidential convention. Con con convention. Pompeo hailed the boss foreign policy record and included North Korea, although the engagement with Kim Jong-un has, has produced no agreements. Well, it hasn't produced any agreements, but it has produced results because we don't have missiles going up every other day. While there was somewhat less Biden bashing on Tuesday night, though, there were false claims that he's for open borders and total amnesty. Um, what's striking about both conventions is the overall level of apocalypse apocalyptic rhetoric. To hear the Democrats tell it, a Trump re-election would mean a death knell for the democracy in an uncontrolled pandemic, heartless immigration policy, and endless corruption. To hear the Republicans tell it, a Biden victory would mean more urban riots, a ban on private health insurance, the elimination of fossil fuels, and the end of free speech. And yet most of the media don't blink at the more extreme attacks on Trump because they basically buy into that rhetoric. One thing the president's defenders haven't quite figured out, if racial unrest, big city violence, health care problems, and the shattered economy are threatening to ruin America, why hasn't Trump been able to stop those things? He is the president running as an outside insurgent. The best they've been able to do is that Trump made America great before the China virus undid much of the progress, and he can do it again. Um, of <laughs> Obviously, they fail to mention, this article fails to mention, that um, Republicans' platform is limited government and states' rights. So this is highly consistent with Trump's political philosophy, that the states have the right to deal with the mess that they have going on in their cities. And also, it's a little bit, I mean, it's also politically advantageous for him as well, which this article seems to ignore, um, that uh, riots in Democratic cities probably are going to make the Democrats look bad. I'm not saying that he should do that or he shouldn't do that, but we can't ignore the fact that it is politically advantageous um, for him to just allow the riots to continue. And, I mean... I, when people ask for help, he helps. He sends the National Guard. He'll, he'll send uh, federal officers, the FBI, anybody he can send other than the military. It's illegal for him to send the military. The next two nights will show whether Melania Trump's speech was just a brief a respite. <sighs> I'm not sure how fair and balanced that article was, but that is a good look at the, I mean, it covers all the kind of the big points um, and I agreed with a lot of what was in this article. I did. I. I. Um, I wasn't sure how Pam Bondi's speech was gonna was gonna play, because it was just basically going for the jugular, um, and saying that Biden is corrupt. I mean, she didn't mince words there. She laid out a case of Biden being a very corrupt person that. Um, um, like did not care about the country, only cared about enriching his son and relatives. 
um, and she laid out a pretty compelling case for it. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's a speech that should have been done in, a, in this convention, but definitely check out her speech because it, it's a compelling speech. It's a compelling work of... Uh, anyway. Um, thanks for uh, watching this video. Let me know what your thoughts were on the night two of the Republican convention. I, I didn't cover night one, and I'm not sure I'm going to cover any more nights. I'm not really um, a big f fan of these conventions. I don't know if they do much. Um, I just happened to, you know, tune into it tonight, so I figured I would talk about what I saw. Um, but uh, uh, leave a comment. Um, keep the discussion going. Um, subscribe to my channel. I'm only, um, I'm not that far away from 20,000. Um, it would be great if I go over 20,000 um, in the next day or two. Um, subscribers, um, hit the like button. That helps spread the video over YouTube um, and helps me out. Um, share the video on all your social media platforms if you think that it's worthy to be shared. And um, I appreciate you watching. I'd like to give a shout out to the main fusion center, a secret main state police department set up in the week of 9-11 to spy on terrorists, but now spy on anybody who's a little critical of the state of Maine. They have spied on me, they've spied on um, peaceful protesters, um, they've spied on people that were against a power line going through Maine, they've spied on uh, Black Lives Matter protesters. And they are my most loyal fan. They've watched all my videos, read all my posts. So a big shout out to the Maine State Police Fusion Center. These videos do take a lot of time. I don't make money on them. So if you would not mind, go check out my website, um, nationalsi.com. And um, if you know anybody who does insurance fraud assignments, um, insurance adjusters, lawyers, um, please email me their contact information so that I can reach out to them. Um, I'm in the New England area. I'm licensed um, in uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont. I work in Rhode Island and also I'm, I'm down in the south too in Tennessee. Um, um, so any of those areas are, are great. If you know people that are in the industry, please forward their information. It would be very, very helpful. Um, also check out my store. Um, you can buy cool t-shirts and uh, mugs and different things that help support my work. I just want to get to the truth. That's my goal with every case, with every um, story that I do. And um, the truth and uncovering the truth is very important, no matter where it leads. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare place for you. And if I go and prepare place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also.